of Field Research, a global journey, webinar series to mark the retirement of Sir Harry Badishia. Speaker is Dr. Shurav Das. I can uh, vividly remember that evening when I had a detailed discussion with Harry in the guest house of Tata Steel in Jamshedpur. Actually, I was uh, working in uh, Tata Steel at the time, and Harry had made uh, one of his visits to Tata Steel, and I did not want to waste that opportunity to have a good discussion with him regarding various aspects, especially the design aspects. And uh, the steel, the reality or the realization of the steel actually is the uh, outcome of that uh, long discussion. Thank you, Harry, for providing me that opportunity to have a thorough discussion with you regarding this matter. And thank to the organizer of this uh, conference series to provide me an opportunity to showcase this work to the global audience. So first, uh, let me uh, show my gratitude to my uh, group members, previous group members, colleagues of Tata Steel in Jamshedpur, in uh, Netherlands and in UK. Certainly, uh, I'm grateful to my Diden manager, Onang Shohalda, Devashir Bhatchaj, and of course to Harry. And some part of the work is uh, still being continued here in IIT Roorkee, for which I'm grateful to my PhD scholars and MTech students, the administration of metallurgical and materials engineering department, and of course, to some funding agencies. Let us first uh, start with the design criteria. The objective of this uh, work was to develop a bayonetic steel, which can deliver at least 1200 MPS strength with minimum 20% of elongation. By mentioning bayonetic steel, I'm actually not mentioning say 100% bayonite, but it should be having some austenite as well, but certainly it will not have ferrite or cementite. That is the diffusional transformation we are not going to allow. In order to achieve higher strength, we need to have bayonite to be formed at low temperature. So the bayonet start temperature should be as low as possible. And martensite start temperature should be even below that so that uh, we, can, we can have a proper window to play around it. If the difference between DS and MS is too small, then it will be difficult to maintain the proper temperature in the actual plant level. So sufficient gap between DS and MS temperature should be there. And large amount of austenite, at least 20% of austenite should be there for a target elongation of 20%. And above all, the steel must be cheap, cheap enough than even a piece of mineral water, even a can of mineral water. And it can be produced in industrial hot strip mill cooling and coiling situation. So these are the typical boundary conditions which are there. And all the alloy design has to be performed keeping these things in mind. First, we started with uh, several uh, calculations uh, using, again, here is the program, MUCG. I'm just uh, showing only three compositions, but uh, in reality, there are many, many more. Our objective was to minimize the BS temperature, minimize the MS temperature, and to have the diffusional bay sufficiently shifted towards the right side so that a typical cooling rate of say even 10, 15, 20 degrees centigrade can avoid going through the diffusional part of the TTT car. So, with, with uh, all of these three uh, compositions that can be achieved. I, I'll show you the exact uh, composition in a later slide. 
So diffusional transformation can be avoided by moderate cooling rate, and uh, it is possible to form bainite at low temperature that uh, 400 degrees centigrade is sufficiently low temperature. Initial MS is uh, sufficiently low. We are getting around say, 100 degree centigrade gap between BS and MS. And once uh, the bainite is formed, the resultant of this bainitic transformation is the enrichment of written austenite with carbon. Whenever that enrichment of written austenite is taking place, that essentially indicates that enriched austenite will have further lower MS temperature. So when we are having MS at uh, the, around say 300 degrees centigrade, after forming bainite, the remaining austenite will have even further low martensite start temperature. And ideally, we don't expect any martensite to be formed at room temperature. This is the calculated uh, T0 curve for that. That uh, whenever we're just uh, going down the temperature, the amount of carbon in austenite that is increasing, leading to even further lower MS temperature of that austenite. And based on that T0 curve, we had calculated the amount of austenite that can be expected at different uh, isothermal holding temperature. There is no theory, or at least I do not know, which can calculate the amount of carbon in austenite during continuous cooling manner. So we had to just uh, divide that entire temperature range into several sections, considering each section as isothermal holding temperature and performed uh, that calculation, the maximum limit of austenite carbon enrichment. And from there, we had calculated this curve that how much austenite is expected if we complete the transformation at each of these transformation temperatures. As expected, the amount of written austenite is continuously decreasing, but not only the written austenite is important, but also the nature of that written austenite, whether that is film type or that is blocky type, that also plays a role, a crucial role. Ideally, the film type is to blocky type austenite ratio should be maintained at one or 0 0.9, close to one, that is. So, the, the, uh, that that is also uh, increasing when when we are reducing the temperature, but uh, when we are reducing the temperature, our overall austenite content is decreasing. So that is a negative part. So we had to struck a compromise here, and this is the calculated uh, bainite volume fraction as a function of time and temperature. It uh, shows that typically within say uh, 45 minutes to one hour. Uh, the bainite uh, can be reached up to say 60%. And uh, if if the steel is kept uh, at the temperature uh, or if the cooling is continued for say three to five hours, we can uh, get more than 70% of bainite. Now, our objective was to allow the phase transformation only after the coiling takes place. In hot step mill, after hot rolling is done, there is the run out table and then the coil is uh, coiled, the strip is coiled. And after coiling, it, it, it takes a pretty long time to come to the room temperature. We uh, experimentally measured that temperature the profile and it was found that at least five to seven hours is needed to come down to a temperature around say 200 degrees centigrade. So we are quite uh, happy with this uh, calculation that our in our case, the bainite volume fraction can reach up to say 70, 75% within say 16,000 seconds, which is around four to five hours time. So uh, after that, uh, with, uh, this is has been uh, patented uh, also in uh, several geographic, and this is the exact uh, composition. Uh, one of the example uh, composition that uh, I'm showing, carbon was the 0.35, silicon 1.65, chrome 1.07, manganese 2, and uh, titanium was a uh, negligible amount. 
the strengthening uh, calculation also we had uh, performed uh, primarily based on the theories and equations proposed by Harry and uh, other uh, researchers like Young, like uh, S.B. Singh and all. So the strength, the final strength uh, can be expressed as the summation of all the components like uh, basic iron, the salt solution, the strengthening due to carbon only, bainite plate thickness and dislocation density. The dislocation density had been calculated uh, following this particular equation. The bainite plate thickness was uh, calculated uh, from a model developed by Singh and Bhadeshia. Uh, and from that model, the thickness was calculated. That uh, thickness was utilized uh, in this uh, particular expression, sigma bainite. And uh, then the strengthening from bainite was uh, obtained. And the final result was like this. So we can expect uh, something like 1600 MPS strength, uh, the calculated strength uh, in the final material. These are all in a theoretical level. Then we uh, had taken the cast. Obviously the first experiment to do is the dilatometer to check whether our initial calculations are correct or not. We uh, had uh, isothermally held the material at uh, different temperatures within that BS and MS for different times. So we could uh, see that no transformation could happen during uh, cooling other than only bainite at the isothermal uh, condition. Bainitic transformation can be completed within initial 45 minutes. And lower the transformation temperature, higher is the volume fraction of bainite. So that is obvious. These are the results of that isothermal transformation. We are getting the uh, written austenite in the range of 18 to 21%, which is quite satisfactory as per our pre previous calculation also. The hardness was uh, quite good in the range of uh, 450 vickers. So we did not uh, spend much on, on further exploring this uh, particular uh, steel, this particular microstructure we went straight to the continuous cooling manner. So this is the typical cooling, typical experimental uh, shading that uh, will uh, go for 900 uh, degree for osmolarization and then uh, quickly the cooling it down to around say 400 degrees centigrade. And then we can impose a very slow cooling rate, which is equivalent to a cooling rate in the coil. In reality, that uh, thermal uh, strategy, if we, if we superimpose on the TTT curve, will look like this. So again, in the uh, dilatometer, we had uh, done similar experiment. The top uh, image is showing the full uh, temperature versus uh, dilatation plot during a continuous cooling manner. And uh, the bottom image is showing only the uh, transformation region as a function of time. So initially the transformation was uh, quite fast, but then the rate of uh, bainite formation is reduced or, or uh, the shrinking due to the cooling that is the uh, gradually uh, taking control. And after point D, there is a, no more bainite formation. And this is the, all the shrinking uh, due to cooling only. So that D point comes typically around say 15,000 seconds during a continuous cooling manner. This is the uh, microstructure of this uh, dilatometer test. Austenite was uh, measured using X-ray. Ferrite was about say 80%. Hardness was about say 410. And these are the color image uh, using La Pera. Uh, we also had done that uh, for image analysis. So uh, from image analysis uh, also, it was uh, coming bainite uh, of the range of 80 plus minus five. Austenite uh, was uh, within uh, 
20 percent plus minus two in that range and some amount of martensite we could not avoid fully but uh, that is the reality we have to carry on with that in ebsd experiment uh, we also uh, couldn't see the presence of any carbide and the austenite was uh, distributed evenly throughout the matrix the ebsd uh, always uh, or in most of the times can underestimate the written austenite uh, percentage and in this case it was a mirroring of the range of 12 to 13 percent but that is fine the initial calculation was uh, uh, was based on considering the bainite plate thickness of the range of uh, 80 to 100 nanometer and th this is the tm images uh, to show that uh, our initial calculation was also correct the ultra fine bainite clads can be seen in that uh, montage image. And this is the final tensile property. We are getting uh, more than uh, 1370 MPA strength. Uh, uh, UTS is a uh, 1420 MPA. YS is itself around say 1200 MPA. Uniform elongation 16 and total elongation is uh, 21%. When we are done, Joule Prusard analysis of this uh, particular tensile curve, we have seen that uh, there is a change. Uh, there is a uh, there are two slope changes in the uh, analysis. Certainly, that indicates that uh, two work hardening mechanisms are taking place here. The first one uh, can definitely be assigned to that uh, gradual transformation of written austenite to deformation induced martensite formation and once that uh, once all the austenite is uh, consumed then it becomes the deformation of so the mixture of bainite and martensite all the way up to the fracture we had uh, performed uh, some of the uh, x-ray analysis uh, to find out uh, that uh, the change in the written austenite uh, content according to the strain. So the volume fraction of uh, austenite continuously decreases and work hardening is enhanced. That uh, essentially indicates. Later on, uh, we also wanted to find out uh, the wear behavior or some other mechanical properties. And uh, one of these is uh, wear behavior. Where uh, we had done some sliding wear test a pin on uh, disc setup was used for two different uh, distances. One was 18,000 meter, one was 7,200 meter at uh, different loading. Different uh, surface textures uh, was uh, observed, which indicates that different types of wear mechanisms were acting at different time interval. So there's a gradual change in the wear mechanism thing. While the loading was uh, in a smaller range, say 10 to 20 Newton, the surface was uh, consisting of only alternate groups and furrows. That indicates uh, abrasive wear, that uh, micro cutting and plowing. But when the load was increased to say 50 to near 30 to 50 Newton, a much smoother surface uh, started appearing that uh, essentially indicates the wear mode had been changed to adhesion and fatigue damage. These are the uh, corresponding XRD analysis. If we consider any of the peaks, the any of the alpha peaks, we can see that uh, with increasing in load, the peak continuously started shifting towards the left side. And the peak also becomes broadened. In both the cases uh, that have been observed for 7,200 uh, meter and for 18,000 meter. That indicates that uh, with increasing load, the matrix becomes more and more um, deformed. 
So more and more uh, dislocations are generated there. And that has also been reflected uh, in the analysis of the reduction in uh, retinostenite uh, concentration, as well as the increasing in the dislocation density. Ultimately, the still can offer an excellent uh, specific wear rate, which we had uh, compared with some existing publicly available literature reports. And that is the outcome that this particular still can offer a very, very low specific wear rate. Although its uh, hardness is not that great, like some other steels. That uh, very good uh, specific wear rate can also be the originated from the work hardening of the surface. We uh, performed uh, micro hardness uh, test from the surface towards the bulk of the material. And that is the outcome that uh, effect of this uh, wear can be can be visible all the way up to say 100 micron. It's not limited only to the surface region itself. Other than uh, where some other tests, uh, some application oriented uh, tests are also performed uh, in uh, Tata Steel Europe. Like say, uh, the amount of uh, total elongation or the strength, if we change the ostempering temperature, the impact energy that uh, this particular steel can offer. It uh, can be seen that the final mechanical property is dependent on the transformation temperature because the, the stability of austenite will be different at different transformation temperature and that actually plays a significant role in determining the mechanical properties. The average bending angle is the, one of the most important parameters in some uh, cases in automotive uh, steels. This uh, particular steel can offer a bending angle of the range of say 60 degree when, when it has been measured with a three millimeter thickness. But if the thickness can be reduced down to say one millimeter, the calculated bending angle was the excellent one, more than 100 degree. And uh, Hole expansion ratio is also uh, quite uh, high, at, at least uh, for this particular strength level, that is uh, coming 20 to 25%. Of course, this will depend on, again, the transformation temperature at which the bainite is allowed to fall. Thank you. Thank you, Shuro, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, now we can move to the question. I will ask if anybody has something to ask. Please, now it's your time. But before that, uh, what was the initial application you had in mind for this uh, steel you developed? Yeah, I initially thought of uh, uh, developing uh, this steel was uh, for automotive application for the uh, crash resistance parts. But uh, later on, uh, I was also exploring some other alternatives, like say, the, whether it can be used in, say, lifting and excavation sector, or whether it can be used in, say, for the crane arm, uh, like that. Yeah, but because the so... initial objective uh, at the beginning of uh, starting of this particular work was for automotive crash resistance application only. So the wear resistance came then later, accidentally. Yeah. And now you have, uh, I think, a great wear resistance steel. Yeah, yeah, incidentally. So, Surab, um, it's Harry. Yeah. Um, so, do you think that the design procedure for Benetic steels is established, or is there more work needed to predict the properties rather than the microstructure? Um. For microstructure, it can be, um, it is becoming a standard uh, using all your theory and uh, formulae. But for mechanical properties, it's really a bit of hunch 
a bit of uh, intuition for tensile strength we can get something but for properties like say even elongation it, it, it's not possible to predict that how much elongation we can get it was my idea that okay 20 percent of written austenite can give me around say 20 percent of elongation but i i really don't have any data or any knowledge that yes exactly 20 percent austenite is needed for 20 percent of elongation and this is the situation for a simple test like say hardness or tensile and definitely for other complicated test impact energy or say fatigue or say even wear certainly this is difficult okay thank you thank you harry following up on harry questions uh sure do you think uh, for the mechanical properties would be better to use like some machine learning methods uh or just used uh, the simple rule of mixtures you showed in the talk? Uh, actually, I, I haven't shown a work here. I had done uh, one neural net analysis for predicting the specific wear rate for different grades of steel. Okay, where the input of the steel composition and different uh, processing parameters, the uh, load or temperature or the rise in temperature or tempering or whatever. And uh, from there, we can get some idea that, okay, how much specific wear rate one particular steel can offer. That work is uh, published, that is also available in a Harry's website but I have not included that thing here in this particular presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, questions from the audience. Uh, please unmute Antonio Sergio Medeiros Fonseca. Uh, hello. Um, I have a question. Uh, for COIS, you said uh, that uh, we have a, a, so a slow cooling rate that makes possible the, the Bennett transformation. When I try to make a parallel for pipe producing uh, process, we will not have this kind of, uh, say, possibility. Uh, we, we will have uh, probably to use uh, house tempering, so to put the pipe inside of a, a furnace in low temperature and, and keep there for a long time, and then makes the industrial, say, uh, application uh, not so easy because you consume a lot of uh, time in the furnace and it's not really productivity. Uh, would it be possible to, to change the chemical composition to add some chemical element in order to speed up the, the Benic transformation and to shift the CCT curve to the left? And then when we cool down, uh, it will uh, automatically produce more Benic on it and, and keep the austenite like uh, you you're showing the concept yeah the, it's a the good uh, question yes uh, this is uh, a problem when you want to when you want to produce bainite through isothermal holding then this particular philosophy may not work see there are elements which can definitely uh, accelerate the bainitic transformation if you add some elements like say aluminum or say cobalt, it can accelerate the bainitic transformation, but then the cost will go up. Yes, exactly. The initial objective, the initial objective of this particular work was to develop steel for automotive application where cost is a prime concern. So we we from the very beginning itself, we are very much concerned that uh, whatever the costly elements are there, we have to avoid those things. And that is why this has become almost a plain carbon manganese silicon chrome steel with minimal alloying addition. The cost is a uh, damn cheap, but uh, certainly if the objective is to make bainite in isothermal condition, then some other strategy has to be adopted. But that was not the objective of this particular work. Okay, I just really um, thought how 
to try to apply the concept in a say piper producing route and uh, it's quite hard because it's actually it takes too long time or we, i need a very slow cooling rate that normally is not uh, able to to be managed uh, say inside of the oh. the current uh, say process unless you have a very big uh, furnace or a uh, lot of furnace that you can keep the the pipe there for a long time and cooling very slowly but it's not uh, then is the cost will be also very high okay but it's very interesting the work thank you antonio okay. we have a question in the chat from arvas chakraborty uh, they are observing a very high scatter as so far as fatigue properties are concerned can you please indicate the reasons behind such observations? Um, one possible observation uh, could be the difference in microstructure. This is this particular steel we have not yet uh, produced in large scale. These are the uh, production of a narrow strip mill where the coiling was not absolutely properly done. So that might have resulted in some mismatch in the, or heterogeneity in the final microstructure. And that might have led to this kind of scatter. But if the coiling is done properly, then, then this kind of scatter should not be there. 